Mitra Surik was one of the most unique individuals in the galaxy. While a strong-minded leader and a powerful Jedi, her uniqueness does not stem from her connection to the Force. Regarded by some of her masters as mediocre and ordinary, Surik was perceived as an average student of the Jedi Order. And indeed, she was not a unique thread in the fabric of the Force, nor was she the strongest. In times future and times past, there will be individuals who more than her deeply hear and respond to its voice, those who will shift its currents to achieve great and terrible things. But no Jedi or Sith ever will make the choice she made. Indeed, Mitra Surik was not a unique thread in the fabric of the Force. She was not a thread at all. You are not a Jedi, not truly. And it is for that that I love you. As many Jedi before her, Mitra Surik was found and separated from her parents by the Jedi Order at a very young age. She began her training at the Jedi Enclave on Dantuin, informally under the guiding hand of the Jedi Knight Kavar. This informal apprenticeship lasted long enough for the two to develop a strong bond as friends. After a time, however, Kavar would choose to fight in the early skirmishes of the Mandalorian Wars. His decision meant that Surik was left under the tutelage of other masters, including one Vima Sunrider, who reportedly often had to caution young Surik to be mindful of her powers, especially her aptitude for severing one's connection to the Force. While there is not much detail known about Surik's training as a Padawan, this caution suggests that she possessed an inclination for manipulating or interfering with the Force in a way that separates herself, or perhaps even others, from its influence. The path of the Jedi is not an easy one, and many challenges and obstacles lie upon it. It is safe to presume that Surik's trait to distance herself from the Force would manifest itself in cases where it could benefit her, perhaps in cases of emotional withdrawal, temptation of the dark side, or simply instances where it was easier to cope with the challenge at hand. Although a difficult fact to accept for most Force sensitives, not being able to sense the Force does offer certain advantages. At a later point in her life, Master Rook would tell Surik that she was always difficult to read, even as a Padawan. There's no doubt that her ability to tamper with her connection to the Force, whether instinctively or intentionally, would impact the perceptions of Force sensitives around her. Still, this trait, while unique, would not be of significant importance to Mitra Surik until later in life. In 3976, when Surik was a young Padawan, the Mandalorians would begin their crusade against the galaxy. They raided star systems in the Outer Rim territories for over a decade, until finally deeming themselves capable enough to move closer to the edge of the Galactic Republic in 3965. Around this time, as they began waging war on the Republic in smaller skirmishes, Surik's master, Kavar, left to battle the Mandalorians. Battle after battle, the Republic started suffering greater losses, yet the Jedi Order refused to officially enter the conflict and fully support the Republic with its forces. Two Jedi Knights, Revan and Malak, defied the Jedi Council. They challenged the Mandalorian fierceness and brutality on the battlefield with a viciousness of their own. While the Order didn't openly and officially enter the conflict, they allowed Revan's faction to engage the Mandalorians. Mitra Surik, had much compassion for the lives lost under Mandalorian fire. Inspired by her former master, Kavar, 
she too decided to join the conflict, after being personally recruited by Malak himself. Her choice would leave a prospective Padawan, Mikal, without a master and a mentor. In merely a few years, Revan would prove himself as a commander and a tactician worthy of leading a third of the Republic military. However, Revan's command would often involve taking moral shortcuts, sacrificing resources, territory and people to achieve victory. Still, this approach was the only one that appeared to work against the enemy. Only once they matched Mandalorian brutality and fierceness did they begin pushing them back. Surik would prove herself a powerful Jedi, and she would quickly become one of Revan's most trusted generals during the Mandalorian Wars. During this time, she would attain the rank of Jedi Knight. One of the most defining moments of her life happened during the Battle of Duxon, one of Onderon's moons. Duxon was at a critical position, and taking control of it was important to Revan's plans in the war. But the challenge was that the Mandalorians were safely secured deep within the jungle itself after decades of fortifying the moon. This was their territory. Protected by the landscape, weaponry, and jungle's ferocious beasts, any kind of attack appeared impossible. Revan placed Surik in command and ordered a large-scale assault on the moon, an assault that would mark one of the bloodiest battles in the entire war. Revan's plan on Duxon called for hundreds of small attacks, probing the Mandalorian defenses and searching for a weakness. Each engagement resulted in losses, but precious information, culminating in a final charge of the few soldiers that remained across a minefield in an attempt to strike at the Mandalorian emplacements. If you ask us to charge, will it make a difference? Will our sacrifice mean something? With a heavy heart, Knowing each of those who obeyed it would be lost, Surik gave the order. By the battle's end, the jungle floor was littered with bodies of both sides. According to official Mandalorian reports, for each Mandalorian soldier that fell, the Republic paid with ten of theirs. Surik followed her orders and sacrificed the lives of nearly all who followed them. But victory was achieved, and Duxon was theirs. Later on in life, she would reflect at that moment and stand certain that the task would have been impossible to achieve had her forces not been as committed as she was. They followed orders. All of them knew, as she had, that they would either win the Battle of Duxon or lose the Mandalorian Wars. By 3960, Revan's leadership would push the Mandalorians to a final battle of the Mandalorian Wars, which would take place in the vicinity of the planet Malakor V. In secret, Revan tasked the Zabrak engineer Bayo Dua to construct a superweapon known as the Mass Shadow Generator. Revan assigned Surik as the commander of half of the fleet, which would serve as bait to draw Mandalorian forces closer to Malakor V. Everything was going according to plan. However, Revan's forces were delayed by a Mandalorian scouting party outside of the system. By the time his forces reached Malakor V, a fierce naval battle was already underway. Revan directed his forces to engage, and after he successfully boarded Mandalore's flagship, he faced Mandalore the Ultimate. Seeing that defeat was inevitable, Mandalore the Ultimate decided to challenge Revan to a duel to the death. Mandalore was a capable opponent, but despite his best efforts, he was defeated. Yet the battle was not over, as Revan's forces continued to push the Mandalorians closer to Malakor V. There, in orbit, Surik waited to give the order. I remember standing on the bridge with you and watching the destruction of the Republic watching ships full of soldiers and Jedi burn and die. I remember the look you had when you turned to me. It was the longest you'd ever looked at me. You didn't say anything, just a nod. Events moved quickly then, even in my dreams. Flashes, explosions, you falling. I could feel the pain around me. And then the memory, 
The drifting hulks of the Mandalorian ships, the dead, allies, friends, strangers, and then the echo, lingering, the sound I awaken to in my nightmares. None of us realize the magnitude of what we unleashed, a slaughter caused by one of my creations. As the superweapon activated, it marked the beginning of the end. The Mass Shadow Generator pulled a large number of Mandalorian and Republic ships rapidly towards its surface. So powerful was the pull that, as later records show, starships were deeply embedded into the planet's crust as a result of their powerful impact. While both sides suffered losses, those of the Mandalorians far outweighed the Republic. Seeing the destruction unfold before them, both the toll on their forces and the devastation of an entire planet, the Mandalorians immediately surrendered. Below them, Malachor V was transformed into a broken cluster of planetoids that were only tenuously held together by the gravitational forces. As it deployed, the mass shadow generator's detonation had ravaged the surface of Malachor V. Destruction on such a scale also left an open wound in the force that surrounded the planet. Raven was beyond the range of the superweapon as it detonated, and he was safe aboard his ship. Surik's ship, too, remained intact, but it was close enough for her to feel the consequences of the event through the force. In that moment, as the device activated, she felt the screams of every living thing that was consumed by its mass shadow. Pain, unlike any felt before, their screams reverberated through her mind, like claws digging into flesh, over and over, somehow the pain building upon itself, growing alongside it was fear, searching for an escape in an endless circle, never permitting her mind to retreat to some form of safety. Fear turned to horror to insanity, and yet even there she could not hide. Her mind, driven beyond reason, gave in to instinct. It chose to willingly blind itself to the Force. With this act, the Force itself pulled away from her beam, and much like the planet below, Mitra Surik became a wound in the fabric of the Force. In the aftermath of Malachor's destruction, the Jedi Council summoned Revan and all his followers to answer for their choices. None obeyed the call, and instead followed Revan as he mysteriously departed into the unknown regions, claiming to go on to pursue the remaining Mandalorians. None obeyed the call, except for Surik. Unbeknownst to her, her choices were finally her own, and she chose to return and face the Order. Surik had hoped, but never truly expected them to understand why she was willing to sacrifice everyone she had known to obey orders, regardless if she were forced to do so or not. Even now, she would do what she had done again, and carry the burden of thousands to ensure millions would live. A heavy burden indeed, and a choice no other Jedi could make, should be forced to make. But she did. In hindsight, for her choices, the Council granted her the greatest reward any Jedi could hope for. You are exiled, and you are a Jedi no longer. There is one last thing. Your lightsaber. Surrender it to us. And so it was that Mitra Surik left the Jedi behind, venturing to the Outer Rim 
and hiding from the eyes of the galaxy. Eight years after the destruction of Malachor V and the exile of Mitra Surik, a force was growing in the darkness, lurking on Jedi across the galaxy, killing them without a trace. The Order was weakened, and in an attempt to unveil this unknown threat, the Jedi gathered on Qatar, the colony homeworld of the Miraluka, a force-sensitive species. Qatar was a terrestrial planet covered in mountains and oceans, Although its landscape primarily consisted of mountains, it had a rich flora and fauna. Its inhabitants, the Miraluka, built their cities with a distinctive round-shaped architectural style. The Miraluka possessed an intense connection to the Force, so much so that they evolved without eyes, as they did not need them. A thoughtful and cautious species, they had little interest in personal gain or glory. They had a unique understanding of the Force, believing that good and evil did not exist, and learned to accept both life and death. The Miraluka that lived on Qatar were so in tune with the Force that they felt the events surrounding the Battle of Malachor V light years away. In an attempt to proceed forward, Jedi Master Atrus rallied a secret Jedi convocation, both to unveil the threat that lurked upon them and the means of dealing with it. Given the nature of its inhabitants, Qatar was chosen as the ideal place for such a gathering. They never saw his face, but they did hear his voice. I imagine there are worse deaths. Worse pain. But if there are, I do not know them. I was there when the planet died. To see everything around you extinguished. It was as if I was blinded. It was as if the Force had been bled from the world. The planet was not destroyed. It remains. It orbits. Dead in space. But nothing lives on its surface. It echoes, but there's no one left to hear it. Many Jedi died that day, and a crippling blow to the Order had been dealt. Many of the wise and powerful masters were killed. Fortunately, Atrus was one of the masters who had not attended the gathering. The remaining Jedi went into hiding, scattering across the galaxy, knowing that where Jedi gather, Jedi will die. Atrus took refuge under a polar ice cap on the planet Telos IV. Here, she began to build a secret Jedi Academy in an old irrigation system. She trained a group of half-sisters, specifically trained to resist Force powers. While this made them powerful against Force users and protected them from the influence of the Force, it also separated them from it. Atrus believed this would prevent them from falling to the dark side. Furthermore, as they were not Force-sensitive, their presence in large numbers would not be sensed as intensely. Within this Polar Academy, Atris hid many of the Jedi Order's most valuable artifacts and resources, including many Sith holocrons. These were said to contain forbidden knowledge, but Atris knew she was more than capable of resisting the dark side influence of these artifacts. She would frequently meditate and tap into their knowledge, hoping to discover advantages which would ensure the future of the Jedi Order. Here she would remain and wait until the unknown threat revealed itself, and once it did, she would be ready to face it. It has been approximately one year since the destruction of Qatar. Mitra Surik learns that the Jedi are scattered across the galaxy, and that they are being hunted. Despite the fact that they had exiled her nine years prior, she decides to return. Admiral Karth Onasi, 
orders the Harbinger, a Republic cruiser bound for Onderon, to change course and head to the Outer Rim in order to pick up Surik. She is granted standard quarters and treated as any other passenger, yet her identity is kept secret to such an extent that even the captain doesn't know who she is, nor the purpose for her presence. Surik remains in her quarters for the majority of her trip, as the Harbinger begins its ten-day journey to Telos IV. Its crew was told that the ship is headed to aid in the recovery effort on the planet. At first, the journey appears to be stable, but eventually the Harbinger unexpectedly drops out of hyperspace and remains stationary for a few hours. It is not her business, being a common passenger, to dig deeper into it, but it appears to be an unexpected development. During this time, Sirik is visited by an HK-50 protocol droid. It had been sent a few times prior to check up on her and to see if there was anything she needed. She immediately notices that the droid model is one she hasn't seen before, but she doesn't think much of it. It has been some time since she was aboard a Republic vessel, after all. Shortly thereafter, the Harbinger continues on its way. Business aboard the ship proceeds as usual, with its crew of around 300 continuing to function as it ordinarily would. However, as days pass, a certain degree of anxiety becomes palpable amongst the crew. This becomes increasingly noticeable as Surik heads to the medical bay to conduct a routine medical examination. Every footstep feels as if it were echoed by another. And yet, as she turns, there's none there. There's only... Darkness. Greetings, historian. The next fragment of Mitra Surik, The Complete Story, will become available on the following date. You may, however, access this fragment earlier, within the following time frame, through memberships. Note that The Complete Story is still under construction. As fragments are formed, they will be made available to you. At the time of this fragment's appearance, the completion of the full story is indicated below. These story fragments will try their hardest to arrive on the first Saturday of every month. And, as streams also typically take place on Saturdays, join them to share your thoughts and opinions. There may be one taking place shortly after this video, so examine the top of the description for more information. The knowledge has been imparted to you. Upon our journey, the pieces shall fall into place. 